Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. So today we are talking about Catherine the Great. Um, truly marvelous story, and with some uh, resemblances to Elizabeth, which we'll get into. But um, so, what did I leave out last week? Yeah. So, so first of all, last week, as you know, I I, I had a few flubs. I uh, I had a couple of typos in the in the years twice, which uh, was rather embarrassing. But not only that, but uh, once I uploaded it onto YouTube, somebody pointed out within minutes <laughs> that my picture of uh, Mary Queen of Scots at the block was not Mary Queen of Scots. <laughs> So that was uh, so that was um, oh was shoot it now class? no it was it was uh, somebody comment, commenting on YouTube um, so now I'm I'm drawing a blank here uh, Lady Jane Grey that's who it was this was a, a painting that was made in the 1800s and uh, yeah Lady Jane Grey and I was kind of careless and I just picked up what I. Uh, got offline or online and put that in. So um, this is to you, uh, Isabel Maria. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, so Elizabeth, there's a couple of things that I, I really wanted to uh, uh, tell you. There was uh, right after the uh, the Armada, 1688. Uh, the whole world is now in awe of Elizabeth. And the Pope even made this remarkable comment um, about her. She certainly is a great queen, and were she only a Catholic, she would be our dearly beloved daughter. <laughs> Just look how, at how well she governs. She is only a woman, only mistress of half an island. And yet she makes herself feared by Spain, by France, by the empire, and by all. What a wife she would make. <laughs> and here's the Pope talking. <laughs> what children we would have. <laughs> they would have ruled the whole world. So that was Pope Sextus. <laughs> so there's one other thing. Um, Something that uh, I'm kind of surprised that uh, biographers don't talk more about, and that is uh, her poetry. Elizabeth was, <laughs> I had this up, what happened? Uh, well, this is. There we go. Come on. There we go. So here's a poem that she had written near the end of her life. When I was fair and young, then favor graced me. Of many was I sought their mistress for to be. But I did scorn them all and answer them therefore. Go, go, seek some other where. Importune me no more. How many weeping eyes I made to pine in woe. How many sighing hearts I have skill I have not skill to show, but the prouder grew, prouder, but I the prouder grew, and still this spake therefore: Go, 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 seek some other where, importune me no more. Then spake fair Venus's son, that proud victorious boy, saying, "You dainty dame, for that you be so coy, I will so pluck your plumes." As you shall say no more, go, 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 seek some other where, importune me no more. As soon as he had said, such change grew in my breast, that neither night nor day I could take any rest. Wherefore I did repent that I had said before, go, 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 seek some other where, importune me no more. Isn't that good? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So. On to Catherine. 
Um, truly an amazing woman, Catherine, with, with as I say, some um, likenesses to Elizabeth. Um, only I think Elizabeth uh, would be green with envy at what Catherine could do that she could not. And I'll get into that shortly. So here's our bibliography. Uh, this first one, um, I, so I don't have any short and sweet uh, kids books on Catherine the Great, um, but there are some very good ones here. Um, this first one is, is a, a political more than personal. It's very little about her personal life. Um, so it, it covers mostly uh, the history of Russia during her time as Empress. Uh, Isabel de Mod, Mod, Rod. I'm not even going to try this. Okay, um, the next one, actually, uh, oh, the next one, Mark Rafe, uh, the editor. This is a compilation of various uh, articles uh, about Catherine the Great, scholarly articles that are very good. Uh, I would recommend this one. Um, unfortunately, it was back in 1972, uh, back when uh, the Soviet Union was in power and uh, they weren't releasing a lot of documents that, um, that they had later, so that not all of Catherine's papers had been released uh, at that time. But still, this is very good. Uh, these next two, uh, Henry Troyett and Carolee Erickson, uh, both of these uh, read somewhat like uh, a good novel. Very entertaining to read, very informative. I enjoyed both of them. The, the style of writing I thought was just uh, wonderful. So I, this is my, the two of these are my picks for uh, nice summer reading. Uh, this last one, uh, Robert K. Massey, Catherine the Great. Um, this is the one when you want to know uh, just about everything about Catherine, 625 pages. Um, so, uh, if the name sounds familiar, uh, he's done a number of uh, biographies of Russian characters. Uh, he won the Pulitzer Prize for uh, Peter the Great, and he was also very famous for Nicholas and Alexandra. So, now, off to the movies. Uh, this was in 1996. This was a TV movie uh, starring Catherine Zeta-Jones. has Omar Sharif in there. Um, this, of the three movies that I'm talking about, uh, this is the only one that makes an attempt at being historically accurate. Um, unfortunately, as a TV movie, um, as, as most TV movies are, um, the, the characters get, instead of having a drama, you have melodrama. Uh, and so it, it bothered me somewhat uh, because of that. And, and again, comparatively speaking, it, it was historically on, but that's standards of the movies, which is pretty low. Um, the characters themselves hardly resembled the real characters at all, um, whether by look or uh, by the way they behaved. Um, so uh, the th I think the thing that bothered me most about Catherine herself is that so often she appeared to be just smug and sarcastic rather than serious and brave. So that was my take on that. Um, 1934, uh, Elizabeth Bergner and Douglas Fairbanks Jr., The Rise of Catherine the Great. Uh, this is her story up until the time she becomes the Empress. Um, very little resemblance to what actually happened. She comes off, to me, she comes off like uh, some uh, brainless, ditchy, ditzy blonde, uh, kind of giddy and, and uh, <laughs> now I know. <laughs> no, I know there are no ditzy blondes here, so just beautiful blondes. But I better stop before I get myself in trouble. Um, anyway. <laughs> So anyway, um, yeah, it, just the character itself it doesn't come off well. But as, as a movie, if you divorce it from any reality, it was 
it was okay. This last one with Marlena Dietrich. Um, watching this on YouTube, uh, the production, it's, it's very a poor production. It was a theater production, and so it, it looks like a theater production. Um, I really like Marlena Dietrich as an actor, and she, uh, of all three of these movies, uh, she's the best by far. But uh, of all three movies, this has the least to do with anything that actually happened. <laughs> as a matter of fact, if you watched these three movies back to back, you'd hardly know they were talking about the same person. <laughs> I mean, they're that far apart. So. But anyway, that's, that's the movies for you. So, going back to uh, Peter the Great, uh, the first modern, somewhat modern, uh, czar, uh, emperor of Russia, tried to bring Russia into uh, the modern age, visited Europe, and was enamored of European culture, French culture, uh, which he brought back and tried to shove down the throats of uh, his backwoods Russian cousins and subjects. Um, so then we get to Catherine the First, who was uh, his second wife, um, and she reigned after he died for the next three years until she died. And then there was Peter the um, Second, who was uh, his nephew, I think. Now I'm getting the, the, the stories of how these next few become the emperors are so convoluted that um, I'm, I'm not really going to get into it too much. Uh, next was Anna, uh, who reigned for 10 years. And it's interesting uh, fact that throughout the 1700s, um, women reigned for well over 60 years of it, close to 70 years of the 1700s. Uh, so Anna was next, um, and then there is the tragic Ivan the Sixth, who uh, they chose uh, because of his relationship. I think he was a, a, a nephew or the son of a niece or something like that, and so they chose him. He was not even a year old, oh, wow. <laughs> but uh, they wanted him, and so the regent was taking care of him, and within uh, about a year, and here's Peter the Great, I had to throw that in there. Marvelous painting. Within a year, uh, Elizabeth uh, took over and put him in prison. This uh, one-year-old kid, maybe two at this point, kept him imprisoned for the rest of his life. And told the guards, if anyone ever tries to free him, you will kill him first. That is your orders. And so he was kept in prison, and every once in a while they would take a look at him to see um, if he would be a, pro uh, a prospective uh, emperor, because you know there may not be anybody else, and he, be, he was a, a complete idiot. He had no education, very little human contact, and it was just a, a terribly tragic life this poor kid had until uh, the day that somebody did try to free him. He was in his 20s, and someone did try to free him to make him the emperor, and uh, the guards carried out their duties and killed him before he could be freed. So, okay. So then, uh, so we have Elizabeth, uh, Peter the uh, Third reigned very shortly, and we'll get into that story, and then Catherine, and then uh, her son Paul, and that covers the uh, 18th century. So the background, Catherine uh, was born uh, to German parents. Uh, her father was, the, was Prince Christian August of Anhalt Zerbst, and her mother was uh, Johanna of Holstein Gottorp. Um, a, uh, a minor prince, uh, he wasn't the, uh, the king of, uh, of Anhalt Zerbst, his, his cousin was, and so he was just a minor prince. And um, if you know anything about Germany, 
in those days, Germany really wasn't a country. It was uh, a collection of something like 300 uh, principalities uh, that were collectively known as the Holy Roman Empire. Um, but uh, they were pretty autonomous, these little principalities, and um, they actually came in handy for the rest of Europe because the kings and queens of Europe we're always looking for someone of royal blood. You don't want to marry off your daughter or your son to a commoner. And everywhere, where, everywhere else in Europe, um, they were hard to come by. Germany had them in droves. You had uh, princes and uh, princesses uh, to spare. There was many, many of them. And so when you needed a spouse for your son or daughter, that's where you went to get them. And so um, throughout Europe, uh, there are many Germans uh, who became uh, the kings and queens of the various countries. So, uh, and so she was related to many of the uh, crowned heads of Europe. She was related to uh, the king of Denmark and Peter the Great. Uh, her cousin was, her cousin's son was the heir to the thrones of both uh, Sweden and Russia. And here's what the Ger Germany kind of looked like in those days. Real uh, mess of independent states. Sort of size of a county. Or a city. Many of them were just cities. But that's, that's royalty, and that's what you want. Their blood is better than everybody else's. So Catherine's parents, uh, so she was born April 21st, 1729. Sophie, and her name was Sophie August Friedrich uh, von Anhalt Zerbst. Uh, she was a very active, strong, intelligent, uh, and very opinionated as a child. Um, as she was growing up, uh, even as a young teenager, she was seen as, uh, as an intellectual, that, uh, and she loved being philosophical, they noticed. Her mother uh, was very strict, um, very ambitious for her kids. She was, and of course, disappointed that uh, her firstborn was a girl and not a boy. But she did have a boy uh, later on that uh, uh, made her very happy. She neglected uh, Catherine uh, through a number of years um, until she became a, a teenager, at which point uh, she becomes a commodity. Um, her father, uh, being a poor prince in this relatively poor state, uh, her father needed to get a job. And so he became a Prussian general, which was a very common occupation uh, among princes of Germany. You work for the Prussians. They're the ones with the money and the power. And he was a very, uh, very strict uh, with himself, very self-disciplined, very proper, uh, very religious, which, you know, and they were all Lutherans. Um, so that was her parents. Growing up, she was not considered pretty, although she wasn't considered ugly either. Uh, very somewhat plain. I, I, I imagine that she was somewhat matronly, um, so that when people met her, she, her looks were not striking in any sense, uh, but it was her personality. Uh, somewhat like Cleopatra, who was never considered a beauty, but the, uh, the, the power of her voice and the, uh, the intellect that she had, the charm, uh, was what people really noticed about her. And so um, she, she travels with her mother around the various German principalities, mostly uh, in Prussia. Um, and as I say, as a teenager, she is then a commodity. Who is going to want her uh, for their young uh, prince to become the next possibly heads of uh, some country? Um, but first, I believe she was something like 14 years old, her uncle, her mother's brother, falls in love with her and wanted to marry her. Although it seemed shocking at first, um, because there were no other prospects at the moment, uh, they were seriously considering giving him permission. 
But then there was another prospect. Carl Peter Ulrich, uh, born in 1728, a year older than her, he was the son of Anna Petrovna, granddaughter of Peter the Great. His father was Charles Frederick, Duke of Holstein Gorto. Um, and he was chosen at 14 years old by Elizabeth, because she didn't have any children, to be the heir of the Russian throne. And sadly, he did not measure up very well at all. He was weak. He was terribly childish, uh, pear-shaped. Uh, he loved playing with army dolls <coughs> well into his 20s. <laughs> Just, uh, yeah, very, very childlike. Um, he's somewhat moderate intelligence. And being a child in Germany and then taken at 14 to Russia, he loved all things German and he hated all things Russian. And he was to be the next czar. <laughs> and here is Schleswig Holstein, where he was from. And this is Denmark right up here, and Germany down below. So, Frederick II, also known as Frederick the Great of Prussia, um, sees that Elizabeth is looking for uh, a wife for uh, Peter. So he, he knows the family, and he says Elizabeth should be a good wife. And so he recommended uh, Sophie to uh, Elizabeth. So they send someone down to check her out. She seems to be what they want, so she travels to Russia. She has to become an Orthodox Russian and give up her Lutheran faith, which um, she was somewhat reluctant. Her father was very upset about this, but, um, but she did it. And since she seemed to be what they were looking for, they became betrothed in a four-hour ceremony, which was even longer than her wedding. <laughs> for some reason, they have this grand ceremony just as the betrothal, betrothal, however that's pronounced. And so at this point, she is now the Grand Duchess, and she is 16 years old. And then we come to the wedding ceremony. She, wear, she wears a silver gown that weighs about half as much as she weighs. Um, and on her wedding night, she asks her mother what happens. She had no idea what sex was or how it is done. Her mother scolded her for being so impertinent. impertinent. So, yeah. And so at the uh, wedding ceremony, which is only three hours, uh, plus nine days of celebrations, um, during the, uh, the ball that happened after the wedding ceremony, she's wearing a very heavy crown, uh, tiara of some sort, and she is begging Elizabeth uh, to take it off. If she could take it off now, I mean, it's giving her a splitting headache. And Elizabeth tells her, no, you are to wear this through the ball. She complained enough, so finally she said, okay, take it off for a couple minutes. She took it off, and then something else was to happen, so she had to put it right back on. So the wedding day was not uh, a very comfortable affair for her. And here's the uh, happy couple. <laughs> but the, uh, the wedding night was uh, rather bizarre. <laughs> so she was taken to her room and undressed by her ladies uh, in waiting. And so she waited for her husband to arrive. And she waited and waited for hours. And he was not showing up. And so she went to somebody and said, where is he? Is he coming? And they said, well, he went to have a good time with his friends. So he went to some party and kept the celebration going. Finally, uh, somewhere in the middle of the night, he comes in and he is drunk off his, 
off his noggin, and he comes in, collapses on the bed, and passes out. So uh, the first night was quiet, <laughs> but she soon found that he was completely incapable of having sex. He had some deformity or other that uh, prevented him from having sex. And, uh, and he wasn't about to talk about it with anybody either. So uh, aside from that, he was a horrible husband. Uh, he, be he became a tyrant. He had his valet was uh, teaching him how to be a good husband. And that was to keep your wife in line. She is to live in fear of your displeasure. That is how you do, how you keep your wife in line, make her afraid of you. So every so often, you need to beat her, just because. Um, and if that wasn't bad enough, he wanted to flirt with other women of the court. Um, and he's quite open about it. And he would let her know that uh, this other woman is better than you, that I like her, I'm in love with her, and not really you. Um, both of them, however, lived under the thumb of Elizabeth, who could be fairly tyrannical herself. Uh, by turns, she could be sweet and loving and kind and giving, and then she could be an absolute horror to the court. Um, and she was somewhat like uh, the queen in uh, Snow White. <laughs> And she would check to see if she was the fairest of them all. And if any lady in waiting, any woman of the court, appeared dressed nicer than her, she would humiliate her in front of everyone. And there is this one famous case in particular where a woman dressed in a type of dress that she had already told everybody not to wear. It's like, these are my colors, so you do not wear this. And this woman came. Uh, trouncing in and, and in some ball with her hair all done up nicely and wearing this beautiful gown and Elizabeth came up to her or ordered Elizabeth to come to her I should say and uh, promptly cut her hair with a knife cutting the ribbons out and ordered her out had her arrested and then came up with some other charges to make it look good some sort of treason or other and then she was ordered to have her tongue cut out. Oh. Now, fortunately for this young woman, um, she had some money and she bribed the guy who was to do the deed to not do it. And so when she was there and, and people were watching, um, he cut her in the mouth so that she bled, but she kept her tongue and promptly left as, and left as far as, what, got as far as way from Elizabeth as she could. And here she is, very beautiful woman, Elizabeth, and she wanted to make sure she was the fairest of them all. So, Elizabeth, um, an interesting woman, she had this frenetic energy uh, could have been bipolar, because she could be up and then she could be in the depths of depression as well. Um, and as I say, she could be very kind, generous and giving, and then could be horribly vicious and ruthless. Um, and I just went over this and here's my slide, huh? <laughs> um, so it was Countess Lupukin that uh, had to face her wrath. So we have a problem. Russia must have an heir. And uh, Catherine is not producing anybody. She's not getting pregnant. It must be her fault. <laughs> so Elizabeth uh, told the two of them that they were both going to be watched very carefully and they were going to be together. Uh, Peter had decided he didn't really like being around Catherine and that was noticed. And so Elizabeth said, you two are going to spend time together by order of the Empress, and you will produce an heir. So for some time, they were being watched over by uh, Maria and Nicholas Choglokov, uh, not very pleasant people to be around, very strict, uh, very uh, rather mean to both of them. Uh, 
but they were to be together. That was the order. And so they spent time together. And since Peter was the man and he was going to be in charge, they played with his dolls. <laughs> and he taught her how to march like a soldier. And then he would run through drills with her so she knew the, uh, how to march like a real Prussian soldier. And these were Prussian dolls, by the way. He didn't like the Russian ones. Um, but they were not having sex, because he could not. So they're getting desperate. And those who were watching, the Choglikovs, who were watching over them, realized that something was wrong and they needed to do something about it. And so uh, it just so happens there was a young man, Sergei Saltikov, uh, who was uh, flirting with Catherine and showed great interest in her. And so uh, Maria decided to tell him, it's okay, we know what you're doing and we will be okay with it. You will not be turned in, we're not going to punish you we want you to uh, be with Catherine. And so it, it actually took some time because Catherine was not interested in cheating on her husband at first. Uh, but, and this is a few years into their relationship. Um, so he's, he's flirting, he finally wins her over after several months. And um, so she gets pregnant, but has a miscarriage. She gets pregnant again and has another miscarriage uh, and then finally, on her third pregnancy, she bears a child, uh, a son named Paul, they named. Um, and as it turns out, uh, sadly for Catherine, that Sergei was a, uh, he liked to uh, sleep with many women. He was not, he, by the way, he was a married man. He had been married two years before he even started uh, flirting with Catherine. But as it turns out, that's what he did. He goes after a woman to conquer her, and once he gets his way, he is tired of her and moves on to the next. That's what he did with Catherine. Uh, Catherine uh, actually did love him and wanted him uh, as a partner. But uh, after the first pregnancy, he starts losing interest, and she has to go after him to be, you know, be a friend, be a lover, and, and so it was, it was actually difficult for her uh, the third time around to get pregnant. Um, so another uh, cruelty inflicted upon Catherine, once her son was born, uh, they took him immediately, uh, gave Paul to a wet nurse, and uh, Catherine was left alone. She could not see her own son, and she was not even cared for by any kind of uh, attendance. Uh, for several hours, at least, before somebody finally realizes that she's, she just had a baby, and she's alone in her room. And, and so finally someone came along and, and helped her to another bed to clean her up. Uh, but for the next six weeks, uh, she did not see her son and was pretty much left alone. And here he is, Sergei Saltikov. Um, but, so even though everybody knows that Sergei is the father, uh, it was let out that Peter now has a son. <laughs> because he can't inherit the throne if he's a bastard, if he's illegitimate, and he's not even the son of, the, uh, of Peter. So uh, the whole court knew that it was Sergei's, but they're going to uh, make sure that every, on the outside world, uh, this is Peter's son. <clears throat> now, right about this time, um, that uh, Peter has, is now talking to people and telling them his problem. And so there, a doctor comes along and says, you know, this is actually fairly easily fixed with a, uh, something like a circumcision will do the trick. And so um, 
his buddies, actually Sergei was the one who was really pushing this because he didn't want to be caught uh, impregnating uh, the, the Grand Duchess. So he convinced Peter uh, to have this little surgery. And so uh, Peter gets very drunk and um, he, he is convinced. And so they perform this surgery and uh, once he is healed, they give him some lady of the court to practice on. <laughs> to make sure that it works. <laughs> and so he could perform after that. Uh, apparently not well, because uh, Catherine never did have a child from him. But Catherine is on to her next lover. Stanislaus Pony, Pony uh, Any Russians here that can pronounce this good? <laughs> Poniatowski, very good. French and Russian, that's great. Czech also. Oh, wow, wow. You need to keep you around. Um, Poniatowski, um, who was a Polish, he was a secretary to an Englishman, but he was Polish. Um, he's 23, uh, Catherine's 26, this is 1755. And um, the two of them had a daughter, Anna, uh, who sadly died at two years old. Um, Stanislaus uh, was sent back to Poland um, and later became the king of Poland uh, through the influence of Catherine. And there he is, Stanislaus Poniatowski. So Stanislaus is sent back to Poland. So we now have our next lover, <laughs> Gregory Orloff. He was a great hero in uh, the war, uh, the Seven Years' War, which is raging on in Europe at this time. A very tall, handsome man, um, very athletic. He's 25, she's 30. Um, she becomes pregnant, uh, 1761, and has a son, Alexei Grigorievich Bobrinsky, and then has a daughter, uh, <laughs> what are you How does that look like? The bottom, yeah, the bottom, the bottom one. one. Yell it. Yell it. Savita. Yell it. Savita. Yell it. Savita. Then yell it. Savita. And you'll notice that, yeah, you will notice that both of their middle names uh, sound like Gregory. So they were not even trying to hide it at this point. <laughs> So Gregory, uh, this tall, handsome uh, stud, is, uh, becomes the lover. And again, uh, Catherine is deeply in love with him. He's a very handsome man. He has uh, brothers who are also in the army, and they all serve her well when the time comes um, to take power. Um, so Catherine usually, and this is not the end of her lovers, by the way, but she usually likes these tall, charming, handsome men. Peter, on the other hand, he likes short, fat, ugly women. <laughs> so, so Peter, one of the ladies in waiting, uh, Elizabeth Vorontsova, um, they say was the ugliest of Catherine's ladies in waiting. She was foul mouthed, hunchbacked, fat, squint eyed, pockmarked, bad mannered, smelly, slobbering, graceless, and would often quarrel with Peter. So, so you wonder why in the world would Peter cho choose someone who was the least desirable in most people's eyes. Uh, some, some historians will say it's because he had such a complex about himself that he needed someone who was very base and low to make him feel good about himself. And yeah, I suppose that's possible. And here she is, Elizabeth. Well, you have to understand, this is not a photograph, this right. is a painting. <laughs> if you want to make your living as an artist, yeah. you do not yeah. paint reality, okay? Yeah. 
And so we're coming to Elizabeth, uh, her last days. Um, as the years passed and she could see uh, what her nephew was like and what Catherine was like, she really did not intend to uh, like Catherine very much. Uh, she was very harsh towards her many times and wanted to promote Peter as this great next ruler of Russia. But as it turns out, Peter was nothing like any kind of a great person. And she came to realize that over time and grew to despise him and grudgingly uh, truly admired Catherine. And I love this quote. She's brilliant, my niece. She loves truth and justice, but my nephew is an idiot. <laughs> so Elizabeth passes on. December 25th. 1761, and Peter is absolutely giddy with joy that this wicked old witch is now dead and that he can be the emperor and do anything he likes. Um, and so, since he was so happy, uh, the funeral ceremonies, uh, he did not wear black because he didn't feel like it. He did not show any sort of respect towards the, uh, the coffin or the ceremony uh, or any of it. <coughs> Catherine, on the other hand, was very dutiful throughout the whole ordeal. Uh, she attends to the funeral. She prays before the casket um, as she was supposed to do, not just on, any partic on the particular day of the funeral, but she came back day in and day out for weeks to pray before the coffin, wearing black. Yes? What was the issue with the religion? Because she came from a religion that was not orthodox. Uh, where, where did that stand? So um, she gave up. She was a Lutheran, and her parents were Lutheran. And uh, when she came to Russia, she was told, you have to become orthodox. And she did. So she went through all that. And that's where they changed her name from Sophia to Catherine. And so this is noticed by everyone. Here's a Catherine who's so pious, who's so dutiful, who's doing what she's supposed to do, showing reverence for Elizabeth. And here's the, uh, the idiot Peter who shows no respect, seems very happy, does not wear black, does not walk in the procession. Um, and so people are talking. Uh, what kind of a emperor do we have now? Uh, so, and uh, so Peter takes charge. He actually does a number of things that are not so bad. Uh, he released political prisoners, some of them. Uh, he ends the war with Prussia. Prussia is German. He hated the fact that the Russians were in a war with Prussia. And he hated even more that Prussia was losing. And he let everybody know that as soon as Elizabeth dies, we're going to end this war. And the, uh, the advisors around Elizabeth were hoping and praying that Elizabeth could hold on just a few more months because they were winning. They were going to get all kinds of territory from Prussia. But she dies right near the end. And so immediately, Peter calls off the war sends all the prisoners back, prisoners of war, you are now released. And he sends a message to Frederick that um, I, I am going to ask for nothing from you. You will keep all of your territory. Uh, the Prussians were expecting that they were going to lose a lot. And they were overjoyed that uh, Peter now is in power. But he starts doing some truly foolish things um, he orders the, the guards to start wearing Prussian-looking uniforms. He orders the Orthodox priests to start looking like Lutheran priests, <laughs> wearing the dark uh, frocks, cut their beards. And this is all across Russia. He's telling people to do this. Um, so he is, he's making enemies immediately. And so people are telling Catherine, that uh, she needs to take charge. She needs to uh, depose him. And there are plenty of officers who are willing to support this. 
uh, not the least of which uh, was her former lover, our, our new lover, uh, Gregory Orloff, and his brothers. So Peter is going to start a new war. He's done with Prussia, uh, and uh, and the, the uh, military is pretty fatigued at this point. The Seven Years' War has worn on uh, the Russian finances and the soldiers pretty heavily, but uh, he needs to go to war against Denmark because where he was from, Schleswig-Holstein, uh, the uh, Schleswig part of it uh, has been taken over by Denmark, or at least there are threatenings of that. And so immediately, uh, the, the following summer, he's organizing his military and he's going to go on a campaign to, uh, to deal with the Danes. Now his advisors who are loyal to him are telling him, you know what, you really should crown yourself king first before you do this. Because, you know, if you leave, you never know what Catherine might do. And he just kind of blew it off like, oh, don't worry about that. Uh, we'll be fine. Catherine isn't going to do anything. So as he is preparing to go, uh, just a few miles away, he's gathering his army. Um, Catherine uh, escapes from Peterhof, which is a town uh, right out of St. Petersburg, a few miles, um, taken by Gregory uh, back to St. Petersburg and proclaimed empress of the Russians. Peter hears about this, and at first he's just going to send some guards to take care of it, send a, a detachment and, and arrest her and bring her back. But then they see that uh, it's gathering strength. People all around St. Petersburg are cheering her and are very happy that this is happening. So uh, he's getting nervous, so he decides to go to the, uh, the fortress of Kronstadt, which is in the, in the bay. I'll show you a picture of this. Um, and as he is being rowed out to this fortress in the bay, um, he's, at, he's, telling, he's ordering the guards to uh, let down the bridge, open up the gates, and they tell him no. And he says, I am the emperor. This is Peter, the emperor of Russia. And the guard answers back. We have no emperor. We have an empress now. And at that point, he knew he was finished. And so he was captured, and he was taken to a house out in the country, and they were trying to decide what to do with him. And they thought, well, why don't we put him in the same prison that Ivan the Sixth is in? We can deal with him the same way. If anybody tries to free him, then we'll just have him killed. Uh, well, it was decided for her, Catherine, um, one of Orlov's brothers uh, comes to Catherine and, and falls on his face and says, please forgive me. I've done something terrible. And he's crying and he's so upset. And he says, uh, we got into a drunken brawl. He, he drank too much and Peter did drink a lot. <clears throat> We got into to a big argument, he was fighting, and we fought, and he accidentally died. <laughs> so, so Catherine says, um, well, yeah, we're pretty distressed about this. This could cause problems for our nation, but um, I understand, and uh, I forgive you. So nobody was punished. They put out the story that he died of colic. Um, <laughs> and just left it at that. Um, the, uh, the examiner who examined Peter said he was strangled to death. It was not a drunken brawl, he was strangled. And here, the Gulf of Finland, here's St. Petersburg right here, and this is Kronstadt, the uh, fortress. Uh, he had had his, he was gathering his army uh, in one of these towns here, and um, and so that's, that's where it all happened. So now Catherine is the empress of Russia. And she shows a wisdom beyond what many would have expected of her. 
she was always known as an intellect, and she spent many years as uh, uh, the Duchess, Grand Duchess, uh, with not a lot to do. But she spent that time wisely in reading. She was a voracious reader, and not <laughs> romance novels either. She was reading uh, the great works of the day, um, which I'll talk about in just a second. But um, so she communicates with the governors throughout Russia that um, they are going to have a certain amount of autonomy to run their uh, <coughs> provinces the way they see fit. However, she will receive from you uh, reports, regular detailed reports about what is going on in your province so that we can make sure that you are on the up and up, that things are going well. Uh, she said the same thing to the Senate, that they are to do their jobs, uh, and they were going to write reports as well as to what they were doing. None of this had happened in the past. Uh, Russia was a fairly chaotic uh, state, not a, lot of, uh, not a lot of freedom for officials, and um, not a lot of accountability either. They were not expected to be accountable because they were not expected to have a lot of responsibilities. But now that's changing. Uh, Catherine, uh, not only is she a voracious reader, uh, but she is a workaholic. And she would read dispatches from around the country thoroughly every day. And she would answer them every day. And not to make the same mistake that Peter made, she was going to be crowned right away. So she traveled to Moscow, uh, a city that she truly hated because it was filthy and it smelled and there were cesspits all over the place. And they were very superstitious, uh, religiously superstitious, uh, a lot of uh, religious fanatics there. Uh, she liked simple piety in her religion, not fanaticism. Um, so she had her coronation uh, in September of 1762 and had months of celebrations uh, for that. So here she is, Empress Catherine II. What a marvelous crown that is, huh? Mm -hmm. So the next thing she wants to tackle is the, the law in Russia, which again, very chaotic, not uniform throughout the empire, um, and very unjust to many people. So she has been reading, as I say, uh, she's a voracious reader. She was reading uh, Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws, which in the day was the, the cutting edge of jurisprudence uh, throughout Europe. So she sent instructions. She had this, um, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. So uh, in Russia, there were very few educated, trained jurists who knew much about the law at all. Um, even teaching jurisprudence had only recently begun at Moscow University. Many, many people in Russia, or maybe I should put it on the other hand, very few people in Russia were literate. That was another thing she was going to work on, the education in Russia. She was far better educated than almost anyone at court, and she knew that, and they knew it as well. Sounds like props, can <laughs> Pass that. <laughs> so she wanted uh, a great uh, commission, legislative commission, uh, 1767. She was going to gather people from all around Russia and um, to try to organize or uh, make sense out of the laws of Russia, uh, to streamline them, make them more comprehensible and uniform. And she gave them instructions, 20 chapters 526 articles uh, of instructions that she gave. And as I say, mostly based on Montesquieu's spirit of the laws. Now, unfortunately, when you get 380 people together, 
to uh, accomplish a singular goal, it rarely is uh, effective. So historians will tell you, uh, you know, the, the glass is half full in the sense that the issues were raised and people recognized that something needed to be done. It was very important that these laws get straightened out and people understood that. Now, the process of doing that was going to be a long haul. It's not something that they could just get together and do in a few weeks or even months. But the, the work was started and that was, that was the good part. Uh, very little was accomplished other than the fact that we now know that uh, uh, we're going to work on this. And here's Montesquieu. Uh, he wrote uh, The Spirit of the Laws in 1748, and he talked about such groundbreaking ideas as the separation of powers, uh, presumption of innocence, and habeas corpus. So back to Catherine, as I say, she read voraciously the classics, uh, corresponded with Voltaire regularly, <laughs> loved reading. She, she would let him know that I'm reading everything you ever wrote, and Voltaire wrote a lot. Um, and so they would have uh, these wonderful conversations back and forth. Uh, she invited, yes? So she was fluent in French. She was. Yeah, yeah. Um, she met with uh, Diderot, uh, who was uh, one of the encyclopedists of France. Uh, she invited him to come to Russia, and they, he came, and they spent much time together talking over his ideas and uh, the radical ideas of the French at this time. Uh, and she just, she absolutely loved it. He became uh, a bit of a bore after a while, though, uh, because uh, he would get himself worked up in their conversations, especially over the serfs, which she tried to defend. One, one area uh, that she never did correct uh, was the plight of the serfs. So, but anyway, uh, they would have these conversations and he'd get himself all worked up and start pounding the table uh, to make his point. And um, after a few weeks of this, she, uh, she was glad to see him go. Um, she also recognized that uh, they needed immigration. She invited the Jews to come to Russia, although they had to live outside of Moscow, outside of the big cities, uh, within the pale. And I'm sure you, that sounds uh, familiar. Uh, if something is outside of the pale, that's a bad thing. <laughs> The Jews had to stay within the pale because they were such good merchants that they competed with the city merchants of Moscow or any of the bigger cities. And they also had to pay uh, twice the taxes. Uh, but they came in. Uh, she, he, he, she also invited uh, Germans, the uh, religious groups of Germans, to uh, come live in Russia because she knew that these were hard working people. And, uh, and so they came, uh, the Moravians, Mennonites, <coughs> such. One other thing that uh, Catherine, uh, one of her goals as the Empress of Russia was to expand the territory of Russia. Um, so when Poniatowski was made King of Poland, um, she sent troops in to support him, to make sure that he became King of Poland. Um, at this time, Turkey uh, and Russia had been, there's always tensions between the two because they both were grasping for territory. Um, so Turkey attacked um, and Russia, Catherine, was, uh, wanted the Crimea. This was in Turkish hands at the time and uh, the goal for many years was to take the Crimea and so uh, this first war, the results, uh, Poland, uh, some parts were taken. This is called the first partition of Poland. This is where uh, Russia gradually takes over, one piece at a time, uh, the country of Poland. And they occupied Crimea. Uh, they didn't annex it yet, 
but uh, they had taken, uh, at least kicked the Turks out. And so here's where they attacked. Here's the Crimea. And this is, I have some maps on your handout as well that shows this. This is uh, a very strategic area for Russians because they've now had access to the Black Sea, which could eventually lead them to get to the Mediterranean, something they long wanted. So at this time, some say the last great plague of Europe um, happened 1774. Something like 120,000 Russians are dying of the plague. One fifth of Moscow, the population of Moscow, perishes. Um, Catherine, uh, to her credit, once this passed through, she did everything she could to revive the nation. She tried to encourage industry. Uh, again, she's encouraging immigration from afar, uh, the type of people that she would want, um, and reduced customs duties. Now, one of, another great tradition of the Russians is to have peasant revolts. The greatest of these happened 1773 to 74. Um, this uh, Cossack soldier <coughs> comes along and says, uh, Peter III was not murdered. I am Peter III, and I have come to take my throne back. And so, he rallies peasants all across Russia, and um, there's always discontented serfs and poor. Um, so he rallies them, uh, and since he was such a charismatic figure, um, they came by the tens of thousands to join him and to overthrow uh, the nobility who have been oppressing them. So uh, something like 1,500 nobles had been slaughtered through uh, uh, this peasant revolt. They came. They tried to take uh, Orenburg, uh, but were beaten back. They take another larger city, uh, Kazan, and then they march down the Volga River, slaughtering the nobility and landowners as they went. Um, one of his quotes uh, to his people. He who kills 10 landowners and destroys their houses will become a general. So he was pretty ruthless. So here he is. His name was uh, Pugachev, and here he is sitting, holding court. And uh, nobil nobles standing before him, uh, probably just about to be executed. But it couldn't last uh, forever. Peasant revolts never do. And so um, eventually the Russian troops got the upper hand and defeated them. Um, as, as a result of this whole peasant revolt, uh, something like 4,000 4, Russian troops died and 18,000 peasants uh, died through this operation. Uh, for those who were captured, uh, most of them were par pardoned. Uh, Catherine was not a bloodthirsty sort of person. She liked uh, forgiveness. Uh, there was 300 and some odd who were executed, uh, who were active in the revolt. But she did want to pardon. There was something like 10,000 who were captured at the end, and she wanted them all pardoned. Uh, but as I say, there was 300 and something who were uh, executed as the ringleaders. Yes. Is that not when uh, a lot of the Germans migrated in along the Volga at that time because Catherine was there and they yeah. kind of appreciate yeah. her and they call them German Russians? Yes, yes. And they're not like that. Right, know. right, yeah. Yeah, large German communities. Yes. Was the French Revolution at all inspired by uh, this uh, peasant revolt? Uh, I'm sure it, it all added up as just one more thing that people should be upset about. But the, the French Revolution was French. I mean, it was the issues in France mainly and, and the ideas that were being spread about uh, uh, freedom and fraternity and, 
And what was, was three words? I keep forgetting this. Yeah. Okay, everybody shouts at the same time. That's good. He, he, what, he, Égalité, fraternité. Égalité, fraternity. Yeah, all right. So, our next lover, um, <laughs> Prince G.A. Potemkin. And I'm sure to uh, many of you, Potemkin uh, will sound familiar. Now, unlike most of her lovers, uh, Potemkin uh, was not uh, tall and handsome. He was tall and ugly. Uh, he was a large, slovenly man. Uh, he had one eye uh, when I was injured in battle. Uh, he was a, a military hero, uh, but he was absolutely brilliant and charming, and that's what attracted Catherine to him. Uh, she tired of uh, Gregory Orloff because uh, she realized after, and this was actually her longest uh, affair was with Orloff. Uh, something like 11 years she was with him. Uh, but she got, uh, she was tired of the fact that Orloff, like most men of the day, uh, liked cheating on her and was a flirt with all the women, the ladies in waiting, and had several affairs, and so Catherine had had enough of him. So she falls in love with this uh, war hero who's absolutely brilliant, very uh, intelligent man, uh, and the type of guy who played by his own rules. He was sloppy, he dressed awful, and he didn't care. He could come into the court when everybody is so dressed in such a refined way, and, um, and he was noticed, and people would be in awe of him because he had the self-confidence of someone who could do that. Um, I know I'm, I'm sloppy, and um, so what? So um, she fell in love with him, 1774. Uh, she felt that this was the intellectual companion that she had always wanted. Um, one thing he wanted was to be the co-ruler, and that was something she was never going to allow. She was in charge, and um, however she loved, however much she loved him, um, she was never going to give up her power as empress. Um, and I have a quote. She was a very passionate woman, Catherine. Um, so in a letter that she wrote to Potemkin, this is how she expresses herself, her love to him. What a shame, what a sin. Catherine II, a prey to this mad passion. Everything I have laughed about all my life has happened. I forget everything my reason tells me, and I feel I become quite stupid when I am in your presence. I forget the whole world when I am with you. I have never been so happy as I am now. And this happiness lasted a couple of years um, until he became uh, the man who wanted power as well. And she could not allow that. And he was not going to stand for being uh, second to a woman. So uh, they were still friends and she gave him uh, a governorship in the new territories that had been taken over. And here he is, Gregory Potemkin. Now, for those of you who uh, recognize that name, it's because you consider, you put it together with Potemkin Village. Gregory Potemkin was a genius uh, as an organizer and in building cities and planning and uh, organizing people in these new territories. So he sent down there with the express uh, order to uh, bring in immigration and set up new cities. And that's what he did, and he did it brilliantly. Uh, Catherine went down to visit, uh, 1787, uh, and this is like Elizabeth, she goes on progress, like all monarchs of the day, you have to go on progress every so often so that people see you and see how magnificent you are. 
very important. So she travels down south, and also she's trying to intimidate the Turks as well uh, to let them know how powerful Russia is. Um, so in this district, in just a few years, the population jumps from 200,000 to 800,000 with these immigrants coming in. Um, now, the reason that Potemkin Village is a saying is more because of the, uh, the Soviet era when, um, when Stalin would uh, visit different areas and everybody knew that everything better look just right. So they would paint the trees green uh, or paint the lawns green and put up mock houses just for show uh, to make everybody see that everything looks good. Uh, now, Potemkin himself was charged with this sort of thing, just making a show of this grand presence of these new cities. And some of that is true. Uh, he, he would uh, make a, a greater display than was warranted, but he did make a lot of progress in uh, organizing these cities and these districts as well. So it wasn't all phony. And then we come to the second Turkish war. Um, at this time, uh, they are actually annexing Crimea, but they're building a fleet. Catherine's ordered that they have a navy there in the Black Sea. And the Turks decided that they couldn't stand for this and they had to attack because Russia was constantly <coughs> grasping at more and more territory. So the Turks attacked. Um, the Swedes, uh, who believing now that they have a chance to take back some territory up north, uh, decided that they were going to attack, uh, 1788, and the Poles, who see that uh, Russia is vulnerable, uh, trying to get back some independence, they attack uh, in 1792. Russia defeats all three of them. Of course, there was help from some European powers, um, Prussia, Austria uh, got involved also, but uh, Russia comes out victorious. Um, the Turks at the end had to recognize the uh, Russian annexation of Crimea. They also had to lose uh, Odessa, which is just a few miles uh, to the west. Uh, the Swedes wanted to attack uh, St. Petersburg and they lost many ships. It was a, a great naval battle that was somewhat of a draw, but uh, since the Swedes lost so many ships, uh, they couldn't really attack much more beyond that. There is this thing about Crimea. It keeps getting annexed by Russia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. A recurring theme, recurring. yeah. And of course the Poles uh, in this next partition uh, lose even more territory. So here is uh, the territory that uh, Russia has taken. Here's Crimea, which they already have. Now they take this next territory uh, with Odessa. Now we're coming to Catherine's final years. Um, once her relationship with Orlov was finished, um, she had really many other lovers, which I'm not even gonna get into. Uh, but it, it's really remarkable. Uh, one, one historian uh, estimated that she would have one every other year for many, many years. Um, her last lover uh, lasted for about 10 years or so, the last 10 years of her life. Um, but that was uh, more just a companion rather than a, a sexual partner. Um, but. Um, but she was still, although she had many health issues, uh, she still had a very lively mind and active, and she still lo loved playing with children. Um, and she, she was funny. Something I hadn't mentioned, one of the things that she really loved about Potemkin, that the two of them could get together and put on a show for everyone around them. They were both very good at mimicry, and they would put on a show mimicking various people of the court, and people would just be laughing their heads <laughs> off. Um, and so one of the things that she loved to do too is sing a concert uh, meowing like a cat. <laughs> <laughs> or she would, um, she would sing opera, 
just like someone who's making fun of an opera singer, uh, very high pitched and um, uh, saying this song, Music of the Spheres, and uh, in a comical sort of way, and people just loved it. Um, but she was still, in her 60s, uh, a very hard working woman, uh, working several hours a day, uh, writing dispatches, reading dispatches, giving out orders to her uh, empire. And she finally dies November 6, 1796, of a stroke. Uh, her son Paul, uh, arranged, who is now the emperor, uh, arranged that she and Peter would be entombed next to each other at the uh, Cathedral of Peter and Paul. Uh, it's, it's interesting that he felt real loyalty to his, uh, uh, not to his father, but to the, the man that everybody was supposed to think was his father. He knew that Peter was not his father, but he wanted to uh, go on with the charade that uh, Peter, uh, that he was a descendant of the Tsar Peter. And here is her tomb in the cathedral. Very beautiful. So as uh, kind of a summing up, uh, she accomplished a lot of the goals that she set out to accomplish. She improved the education and pushed for education for all, edu for all uh, property owning families um, and for women as well. Uh, women were considered uh, very low next to men in Russia uh, and even more so than in the rest of Europe. Uh, universities were expanded and improved. Uh, they worked on the judicial, the judiciary throughout her reign. Uh, and of course, she expanded Russian territory quite a bit and um, made government officials more accountable, more efficient. Uh, basically, she was promoting the ideas of the Enlightenment. Uh, and it's, it's a sad testimony. If you've ever seen, if you've ever uh, gone through a course in Russian history, Russian history is uh, like a recurring theme of really awful things happening and then really nice things where it looks like uh, they've turned the corner. They're not going to be so barbaric and things are improving. They are getting enlightenment and then something comes along and destroys it. And as you know, uh, we have the Russian, just when uh, World War I is going on, uh, they overthrow the Tsar, and uh, they're going to have a democratic government. And then Lenin did away with that. Uh, as I say, a recurring theme. Just when uh, another event, uh, the Tsar who is doing away with serfdom, uh, instituting many reforms, and I forget the, which Tsar this was, but uh, he was assassinated, and then they went back to some of the old ways. <laughs> it, it, it's what happened with, uh, with Russia now. I'm not talking about our country, we're talking about <laughs> Yeah. So, so anyway, any other questions? Anything else? All right, thank you very much. Next week. I, I noticed that these great women had you list of accomplishments. That didn't happen with the list. She just lived a long time. You didn't, you didn't have You know, I, I, and that was, that was bad on my part. I really should have. Um, but, yeah, anyway. So next week will be the last week, uh, Margaret Thatcher. And uh, unfortunately, there are no great affairs that she had. Uh, so, but anyway. Careful.